uh, great thought of a sovereign God uh, leads us this morning and to the thoughts that I want to share with you from the Word of God, uh, from a parable that Jesus gave recorded in the Gospel of Mark in chapter 4. So I ask that you open your Bible and turn there to Mark chapter 4. If you're using a pew Bible, and I hope you'll use it, that uh, you'll turn to page, I believe, 734. I'm going to begin the reading at, at verse number uh, 30 and read through verse 34. The, this parable of Jesus has been given the title as the parable of the mustard seed, and you'll see why as we read this passage, and that's the title that I've chosen for the message uh, this morning. So let's now consider this passage, seeking the God, God's blessings as I read it, that we might indeed hear it, hear it in our hearts, hear it in our minds. Mark records these words of our Lord. And he said, that is Jesus, where unto shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what comparison shall we compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which, when it is sown in the earth, is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But when it is sown, it groweth up, and becometh greater than all herbs, and shooteth out great branches, so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. And with many such parables spake he the word unto them, as they were able to hear it. But without a parable spake he not unto them. And when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. Join me now for a further word of prayer. Father, come before you now once again in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to ask this that you would now help us that you would through your servant expound all things to us as you would have us to know from this passage from this parable spoken by our Lord Jesus Christ that we here at Lanes might Lord in, in hearing it and understanding it might make application of it as Lord you will show to us that you will use me to speak. So do I come now, Lord, as the one responsible for giving the exposition of the word that, that I need your grace. I need grace for this moment. I need strength. I need clarity of thought. I need the Spirit to lead me. So I pray, Holy Spirit, come now and do that. And I ask that for the sake of the glory of God. And I say it as well for the sake of your church here on the earth. Teach us now. Help me, Lord, to be true to your word and be glorified now in all things that are said. For this I ask in the name of Christ, my Savior and my King. And amen. <clears throat> the 
parables of Jesus, and we are now looking at, uh, I believe, the first, second, third, the, the, the fourth of these parables. They are intended to, to expose secrets, to reveal mysteries about the kingdom. After Jesus told the parable of the the soils or the sower, in that 11th verse, going back up to the 11th verse, he he said to his disciples, and and by application to us here now, he says, unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. So he is saying to his ordained uh, twelve disciples there, and to those that were around him, that were following him, that, that believed in him, that he is saying, that Jesus is saying, it's, it's my desire and it's the desire of the Father that you should know something that is hidden about the kingdom of God. And and this is for the purpose, uh, that we can discern the purpose for this, that, 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 that not long, perhaps we don't know the exact timing uh, of this, but it's early in Jesus' ministry, there as he ministered in Galilee. But this is, if this is in the first year of his ministry, there's only going to be a couple of more years. And then, of course, Jesus is going to die. And he's going to then ascend back up to the Father. And the disciples are left with the work of going out, preaching, the kingdom of God, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And so Jesus is preparing them. He, he, he wants to encourage them because it's not going to be easy for them. Neither is it easy for us. They had great persecution. They would come to know great persecution then. After Judas takes his life, of course, there's the 11, and I'll speak some more about that in a moment. But but all those 11, and and then when you add uh, the Apostle Paul, they're going to experience such persecution that all of them, except for John, as we understand, are going to be martyred. They're going to lose their life. Now, how is it that, 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 you, that you can do that? How is it that you can be encouraged to persevere in the faith when you're going to be persecuted because of your faith? They need to know something that is hidden from them about the kingdom of God. And part of the issue here as well is that they have their own thoughts about what the kingdom of God is. You remember, even uh, up after Jesus is resurrected from the grave and right before his ascension, what the, the, the apostles that are there come to ask him, when will you bring the kingdom here? That they were still, after three years, somewhat, to say clueless is, is hard. It's a hard thing to say. Let's just say, after three years, there was still a mystery that was there that they couldn't solve. Because they're thinking that now, okay, from the garden, we can go back to the garden. 
in the promise of the seed of the woman who would come. We could then go to Moses and and in his days, and him speaking that there's going to be this prophet that comes after me that, that, that you're going to hear. And through all of the other prophecies given in, in the Old Testament about Messiah coming to establish the kingdom of David, and, and that that kingdom, when it will be established, will be a kingdom forever. They were constantly thinking in terms of Jesus being the king that would sit upon the throne of David there in Jerusalem. They were mistaken about that. They, they, it was still secret to them in, in some way. It was a mystery. And so even, I think, only it was only after the, the outpouring of the Spirit on, on the day of Pentecost where their eyes would be fully opened to see everything that, that Jesus had been speaking about that, that, for that to make sense. And so Jesus is opening the, His words to them through this uh, uh, and an understanding of the kingdom through this parable. And he wants them to be encouraged. He wants them to, to have within them the understanding that's going to allow them to, to, to persevere, as I said, and to do the work of the kingdom. And that's my hope this morning. As we look at this passage, the ultimate aim of this message this morning is to is to assure you. It, it is to encourage you. Be steadfast. Because what we're seeing around us today, we're seeing great darkness, aren't we? I, I was looking at a meme on Facebook and and in this month being so called Pride Month how it is that the the darkness of the culture has taken that which was a promise of God that could be seen by us a reminder that He is a merciful God and not going to destroy this world by a flood anymore, putting the rainbow in the sky. How that has been so twisted now. To speak of sin and the joys of being living in sin. And we begin to wonder Where's the kingdom? We begin to wonder when churches start closing their doors. And certainly, we begin to wonder when we look at our own denomination where, I don't know, I, 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 I didn't think beforehand and before I'm going to say this, but I think it I think it's probably close to being true. Ninety eight percent probably of the churches of the progressive primitive Baptists are struggling to even keep the doors open, many of them having no pastors. And we begin to wonder, don't we, when we when we see all of these things that are occurring, where's the kingdom? Is the kingdom dwindling? This passage, this parable is meant to show us, no, this kingdom is not dwindling. It's not shrinking. But it's continuing on. And it's growing. 
It, it may be somewhat imperceptible to our eyes. But it seems to me the great message here of application is that it's, it's growing. It just, and when you add that to the parable of the seed that grows, the fact that the farmer who plants the seed in the ground then goes to bed at night, rises in the morning, does that over and over again, and that seed that's in the ground shoots up a, a plant. And Jesus said that he does, the farmer doesn't know how that happened. That, 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 that's to encourage us to remain true, to be steadfast. And so that's, that's perhaps the great application here. But, but, but I want us now to, to look more closely at, at, this, at this parable and, and the mystery that is, that is revealed. And, and, and as I mentioned, the big idea, the big idea of, of this parable is, is, I think, simply this. That the kingdom begins small, but then it grows to become large. That, that's just a simple take that we can get uh, from this passage. Of course, I'm going to speak a little more about what all of that, all of that means. Again, this is for our encouragement. This is for uh, our to, to be persistent and persevering in the work that, that is given to us. Because the promise of Jesus was what? Upon this rock, upon himself, upon his redemptive ministry, upon his death, upon his resurrection, shall the church be built. And the church representative of the, manif the visible manifestation of, of the kingdom of God. And Jesus said the gates of hell are not going to prevail. He must prevail. As we sing in that great hymn, Have Faith in God, He cannot fail. He must prevail. So let's look now a little for just a few more moments, a little more closely at, at this teaching and what it is that we can glean from it uh, so that we can make application of it. The first thing to note, again, is, is it really the parable is kind of easy uh, to divide uh, into headings. Uh, there's the heading of, the, uh, of it starting small, the kingdom of God starting small, and then the second is the kingdom of God ends big. And that's kind of the, what we'll look at here. To begin with, it, it says it, we, the, 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 this parable about the kingdom of God speaks to this thought that it begins small. Look at verse 30. Jesus said, Whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what comparison shall we compare it? And now, now here's the mystery. Here's the mystery revealed. Here's the secret that is exposed. Verse 31, it is like a grain of mustard seed, which when it is sown in the earth is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. And so, very simply, the kingdom of God begins small. Now, I, I, I've debated about this, about sharing this, but I think it is important. It, it is like with all parables, brothers and sisters and friends. We need to be careful in, in looking at and trying to dissect every aspect of, of the parable because that can be dangerous. It can lead us down to paths that we do not need to walk. And an example of this uh, is this is this idea of Jesus saying here that the mustard seed is, is the least of all seeds, that it is the smallest of all seeds. And, and there, 
people have fixated upon just that, losing understanding of the whole purpose or the big idea. And they've used it as a point of criticism to say Jesus is in error here when he says that. I, I say that I, because when you're going out and you're having conversations with people, no doubt someone who, is, who doesn't believe in the infallibility of the Scriptures, the inspiration of the Scriptures, they're going to point to this and say, well, Jesus maybe doesn't know everything that he says he knows. He doesn't know all things because there are seeds that are smaller than the mustard seed. And so they'll fixate on that. R.C. Sproul, in a, in a message that he had on this passage, speaks of a seminary professor at a prominent seminary in the 80s and, and 70s and 80s during the time when there was this great argument being made about about the authority of the Scriptures, that the Scriptures were not inerrant or infallible. That, that was a great argument going on in that time. And it still goes on today. But, but he pointed out that this professor, in, in going over this passage in, 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 to his students, came to the understanding, well, Jesus was mistaken. He was wrong. And therefore, because there are seeds that are smaller than the mustard seed, then obviously the, the scriptures are, are not inerrant or infallible. Well, how do you explain that to someone? Well, you explain it this way. It's that Jesus is speaking an idiom a proverb, if you will, that was known in that day. That, 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 that oftentimes the, the rabbis in that day and even before would use the mustard seed as a way of measurement in, 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 in making a point uh, uh, of teaching. And, and I found this helpful by a man named Alfred Edersheim in his work. And I, I just want to I say all this to caution you from, from going down that path of looking at parables in that way. It can be dangerous. We need to get the big idea of the, of the parable. But here, here's what Edersheim writes about that, about that issue. The very idea of parables implies not strict scientific accuracy, but popular pictorialness. It is characteristic of them to present vivid sketches that appeal to the popular mind and exhibit such analogies of higher truths as can be readily perceived by all. Those addressed were not to weigh every detail, either logically or scientifically, but at once to recognize the aptness of the illustration as presented to the popular mind. And Edersheim goes on to speak about the Mishnah and how... Uh, the mustard seed appears in the teachings of rabbis there. So I just want to caution you about that. Well, that being said then, what ways do we see the kingdom being small? Like a mustard seed. How, how can we understand this? Well, I think we can understand it in the following ways. First of all, the kingdom of God begins with one man. And it's the God-man, but, but it is a man nonetheless. It begins with one man among how many who lived in Palestine during that first century? Uh, uh, some figures I've seen is 500,000 to 600,000 people living in there. And it begins with one man. And what about this man? Was he born into a royal family? To a great king on the earth? No. He was born of a virgin, a teenage girl who lived in Nazareth. Was he born in a great palace in Jerusalem? No. He was born in Bethlehem in a stable where no doubt the smells of animal waste were present. Was he raised by important men of learning in Jerusalem? 
the scribes and the Pharisees. No, he was raised by a carpenter who was not even his biological father. What else about this man who brings the kingdom of God into the world? He had no home. He was an itinerant preacher. Jesus said of himself, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. So he was, in some ways, homeless. Isaiah, in his prophecy of the coming Messiah, wrote, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root of a dry ground. He hath no form or comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire of him, desire him. And he was known to come from the city of Nazareth, which led Philip to say, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And he was not even well received by his own family, you remember. They believed him to be, what, beside himself. Insane. What else speaks of the smallness from which the kingdom began? Before ascending into heaven, there were only 11 of his disciples left after Judas killed himself. There, these 11 were part of the 120 in the upper room right before the great outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. What about Palestine itself? Was that a place? What was that place compared to Italy, the seat of Rome, the Roman Empire, or to Greece, or even to Alexandria? In history, there were even those who had expressed the belief in Jesus, you may remember, who, when the multitudes heard him and would follow him, but because of the hardness of Jesus' teachings, they eventually left him. As we find in John 6, 65, Jesus said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him by my Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. So he was losing disciples during his ministry. From one man who would be seen by many as nondescript or ordinary and even beside himself, just a carpenter's son handing off his ministry to 11 disciples living in Palestine, in a city in Palestine, Jerusalem, that that this is from the small beginning of the kingdom. But the kingdom, though starting small, did begin to grow, which brings us to the second thing to note here. The kingdom of God, though it begins small, it grows until it becomes big. Verse 32 of our text, but when it is sown, that is, when the mustard seed is sown, it groweth up and becometh greater than all herbs, and shooteth out great branches, so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. In the beginning chapters of Acts, we see the start of this growth. The shooting out of the great branches, as it were. On the day of Pentecost, when the 120 in the upper room Upon the outpouring of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit attending to the preaching of the gospel, the sowing of the word, made visible the light of Christ, making visible the light of Christ. The Apostle Peter preaching. What happens? 3,000 people were added to the church. A little later on, upon the preaching of Peter and John, attended by the power of the Spirit again, 5,000 souls were added to the church. Do you see what's going on here? And the seed of the Word is cast into the good ground of hearts prepared by the Lord. Fruit is being born. Some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. When the light of Christ is not hidden but put up on a candlestick where it shines abroad enlightening others, and dispelling the darkness of sin, there's growth. When the seed of the word is cast into the ground of a heart prepared by the Lord, by the grace of the Lord, by the power of the Lord, and, and for the glory of the Lord, that plant will come up and the harvest will be put to the sickle. Today, the kingdom of God is found in almost every part of this earth. 
it is estimated that there are right now 2.6 billion Christians worldwide. According to one source, I read, if, if the Lord tarries until he comes again in 2050, it is estimated that there will be 3.3 billion people who follow Jesus. From one man, preaching of the beginning, the, the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom of God, by the sea in Galilee, to the 11 disciples, with him after the resurrection from the dead, to the 120 in the upper room in Jerusalem prior to the day of Pentecost. 2.6 billion Christians are estimated to exist or to live today around the world. Can we not see the mystery revealed here in this passage of the mustard seed? The realm of God's kingdom today is to be found in all of the earth, as I said. It's to be found in people who belong uh, to, to the kingdom of God, a people from out of every nation, kindred, tongue, and tribe. And that's the significance, as I understand, of what it means by the fowls of the air lodging in the shadow of it. I, I don't have the time to, to, to go there. But you go back to Ezekiel chapter 17. In verses 22 and 23, as well as in Daniel chapter 4, verses 10 and 12. And, and you see, I think Jesus is making an allusion to those passages when he adds that thought of the parable that after the branches shoot out this way, the birds come and nest in it. I, I believe that's the believers in all places come and they find a place of sanctuary in Christ, nesting in him, safe. Be I think it's a beautiful picture here. Now, quickly, I, I want to bring to you some words of application. I think you've seen the, the thought here of the small, starting small and ending big. That's the, that's the big idea of this passage, this of, the, of what the kingdom is. It begins small, but it grows and it grows and it grows and it will end big. But I want to conclude with these now thoughts for us here at Lane's about what it is that you and I can take from this. And the very first thing that I would say to you is this. With God, all things are possible. And I'm thankful that's not my words, that's scripture. But I'm telling you, with God, all things are possible. And that's so because as we sang a while ago, he is sovereign. And so what does that mean for us? It means this, that God can take what you think to be the smallest amount of words that you may speak about him and what you may do for him, what you may think is the smallest deeds that you may do for him. That when those things are done with great zeal and earnestness of spirit and out of love for God, God can take that little small thing and he can make something big out of it. That's, that's a lesson that we need here, I think, at Lane's to know because we're small compared to many of the larger churches around. His blessings are the blessings of multiplication. Just as he took the five loaves and the two fishes and fed over 5,000 so he can use us here. At Lanes, though we are small in numbers, living in a small rural community, he can take our works and he brings about great things. The ministry here at Lanes Church, you know, it reaches now to Northern Virginia with Andrew growing up here. Do you know it reaches to the Ukraine 
and the words put on a card by our young people. Those cards were shared to people in a nursing home in Ukraine. We have, as part of being a rural church, and I've, I've, I've looked at this for years, I think, or it, I've observed it, uh, we tend to be at a disadvantage here because we tend not to be a generational church. And a lot of that is because people, the children who grow up here, they, they have to find jobs. They have to, and sometimes those jobs takes them to other places. But even at that, you see how God has used people like Hannah and Jesse, Jesse, the wife of a pastor now and raising up children in church. And I've mentioned Andrew, Andrew preaching in, in Northern Virginia. And there's others that you can probably tell me more about who've grown up here, who are making a difference in other places in the world. But brothers and sisters, you know, not long ago, we were serving the teachers and the staff at Stilson School with a meal Just a simple, small expression of showing thanks to them for what they are doing in working and educating our children. And there was the opportunity presented to pray with one of the staff members who was going through a difficult time. Now, do we believe in chance things happening? I don't. And I don't think you do as well. I think we were there doing that small thing it's, it, compared to any other thing. Just, just sharing a meal, helping with a meal. And in God's timing, we were able to share His love with one who was in need. That's what I'm talking about. I would like to see us more. I'd like to see every pew in here filled. I would like to see the next generation here, more of the next generation here, because we certainly have concerns uh, about our, our future. And, and I as a pastor, and I know the deacons have that concern as well. But I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic. Because of this parable. The kingdom of God is forever. You ought to be optimistic as well. Because with God, all things are possible. All we've got to do is be willing to work. To have zeal. To work because of the great love we have for our Lord Jesus Christ. All we have to do is to preach the kingdom of God, the gospel of the kingdom of God in all of its truth. And then be prepared to see the Lord bless us. And so it's our responsibility. We have responsibilities. But ultimately, what it was that what Paul said, he planted, Apollos watered, that's work. But it is God that gives the increase. So I I pray this morning that that these thoughts would be of encouragement to you. That this parable 
would be of an encouragement to you. I have no reason for us here to believe that God is through with us. I'm thankful for Cal. I'm thankful for Claire. Living a life, trying to live a life that's pleasing to the Lord. For Hannah and and Jesse and and as I said, those are the names that just kind of come to my, my Andrew. Um, you can look back and see the harvest of what the Lord has done here at Lane's Church. He's the same God. We ought to be able to expect, and, and I think Leanna seeing Leanna and and her responsibilities that she has upon her, the influence that she has in her position as a leader. And Addie and Ryland being brought up here in the church. Desmond back there. I tell Desmond he's going to be a preacher one day. I believe God can work in that young man's heart just like he worked in all of our hearts as his people. So let us be optimistic. Let us be encouraged. And that's what the parables, I think these parables in particular of the kingdom, were meant to be for those disciples that Jesus taught. Let's pray. Oh, Father, I pray that you would now cause, Lord, your word to sink deep within our hearts. Because, Lord, we can become so discouraged. We can become, Lord, uh, having a state of wonder or uncertainty about what we are seeing uh, about our future because of what we are seeing in our world around us and but yet lord as you have revealed taken the veil from the eyes of the disciples through parables such as this that lord you would cause our eyes our hearts see the glory of Christ to see of his sovereignty that his kingdom is a kingdom that shall never end oh Lord we here at Lanes we desire to be workers in your kingdom to do your bidding to share with others the light of Christ Help us with wisdom to know what to say, when to say it. Just be near to us and bless us. We humbly ask in Jesus' name.